Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Innalhamdulillah Nahmadahu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi infusina wa min sayyati amalina Man yahdi Allah falamudhu wa min yudhil falahadina Wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu wa ahmadan Insha'Allah ta'ala the last time that I was here we, we went through two courses on da'wah so far. Right? We, we talked about the usul al-da'wah, um, which is um, to whom and what do we call her. No, we talked about um, what is da'wah. And then we talked about to whom and what are we call incorrect. Uh, did we go through any attributes of the da'i, such as sabr, such as tawakul, such as all these things? Yes. We did that part as well? Okay, so we're going to start today in Allah Ta'ala. Hopefully we'll make it all the way through on minhaj, which is the final point when it comes to usul, as far as the, the understanding these principles in a general, concise basis. None of this is going to be too, too specific because the time frame just does not allow time to really get into it would take course after course after course after course. But what I want to do is be concise and brief to give you enough information so that if you decide to do it that way, you do it properly. And this is one thing that I really want to stress is that this is for people um, who are really seriously wanting to get involved in da'wah, it will bring them the most benefit. If someone just goes through this with the intention of, you know, just uh, gaining knowledge, then it's not going to be as much of a benefit to you to begin to put it into practice. Um, when it comes to the methodology or the minhaj, we have to understand one thing uh, specifically about anything in Islam. When it comes to any methodology that we call to be Islamic, any of Thing that we associate with our deen, which we refer to as minhaj, and especially when it comes to minhaj of da'wah, we have to understand that our minhaj is derived from the three best generations of Islam. And this is according to the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, wherein he said, the best generation are those who are with me. And then those who come after them, and then those who come after them. And then he was silent saying that, that these are the three best generations. And then he also in another hadith said that after these three, three generations, every preceding or every um, succeeding generation after that will be worse than the one that came before. Meaning that every generation after the Prophet will continue to deteriorate until Islam becomes in a very, very deteriorated state. And then inshallah ta'ala Allah will bring success through the reestablishment of the righteous khilafah. May we all see that in our lifetime. But what we mean by that is that if we look at these three generations, what happened in these three generations? When we talk about the generations of the, uh, of the companions of the Prophet them, when we talk about the generation of the Tabi'een, and we talk about the generation of the Atba Tabi'een, or the followers of the followers, what happened in these three generations of, um, after the Prophet? Anybody have any suggestion? What happened in these three generations that is, that is prevalent to us today as far as understanding Islam? Any ideas? They were a the minority? They were not, not only were they a minority, but Islam was consolidated into you know, uh, a consolidated phase during these three states. If, we, if you take a tariq al tashri then you'll understand that for, during these three generations, Islam uh, went through a, a phase of, of um, extreme flowering, what they call the flowering phase and a consolidation phase. We look at the imams of fiqh. Who are the great Imams of Fiqh? Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Do they fit within these three generations? Were they part of the Tabi'i? Were they part of the Atba Tabi'i? The Atba Tabi'i. We see these four Imams come into play. So they are contained within these three generations where the Prophet said these would be the best three. We find the great Imams of Fiqh in this, in this time period. When we look at the consolidated books of a hadith, when it comes to knowing the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, we look at like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, uh, even um, uh, Imam uh, Abu Dawood. We find them in these three generations as well. What we now know as the most authentic statements of the Prophet وسلم, the, the, the collections were compiled during these three generations and the sciences of how hadith would be checked came within these three generations. So there is so much now that we are benefiting from 
as far as also the Quran, the Mus'haf that we have now is compiled in these three generations, and the in the in the diacritical marks and the rules of Qirat and all of this was defined in these three generations. So what you will see is that almost everything we have today of benefit from Islam is going to trace back to these three generations. Now, how you get to that point from here, that's a whole other story that, that goes back to the ulama. But at the end of the day, they have to be drawing from this well of information. Because if you're not drawing from this well, uh, well of information, then where you, where's your information coming from? Because these are where we see that Islam gained its credibility as far as knowledge and scholarship goes to what has reached us till today. So that's what I mean by our minhaj comes from these three generations. Um, <clears throat> so when we understand that in Islam, we also can avoid ourselves making a lot of mistakes and faults and so on and so forth. Um, any questions about that? Because I know that was, was trying to explain in a way that was uh, digestible. Did you get the principle I was trying to say? But Alhamdulillah. Now, so when we take anything in Islam, especially when it comes to our da'wah, we, we try to look back to you know what was present and what was done by these three generations since they were the best of the best. And we draw from their information and any scholar of today uh, of repute is going to be drawing from this information. Now, the second thing that you must understand when you go out now and start giving da'wah, when you start talking to people, when you start interacting with people at a da'wah booth, um, at an open house, on a, uh, you know, on an airplane or in the car, or wherever it is you're going to interact with them, these are going to be some things that you must understand. First and foremost is you must understand whom it is you're speaking to. You must understand whom it is you're speaking to. And the reason why is because if you don't now, if you don't know who you're speaking to, then we're going to fall back to some principles that we discussed in the first two categories, was that if you don't know who it is you're talking to, you're not going to have a way to direct them towards the goal of doubt. What is the goal of doubt? Which we spoke about. What is the goal of calling people? What is this doubt? What is it supposed to be drawing people to? Inviting people to Islam. Inviting people to the truth. Tawheed. To Tawheed. In Allah and in Islam and all of its principles. This is the goal of da'wah, correct? To invite people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in Islam in its entirety. How can you pinpoint a person's situation and do this if you don't know whom it is you're speaking to? You may have a good argument in your mind that you want to say, you know, dealing with uh, uh, how to debate with a Trinitarian Christian. You may have watched video after video of Ahmadiyya Zakir Naik, my videos, Yusuf Estes, whatever you want to have you, and now you feel like you're armed to go out and give da'wah. And you go jump and start bashing someone about their belief as Allah is three and destroying the, you know, the, the, the egg uh, um, analogy, destroying the fire analogy, giving them verse after verse of the Bible where Jesus said God is one. Now, if you don't know, know whom you're speaking to, what, how are you going to feel if they tell you, wait a minute, hold on a second. I don't believe in, in, in Christianity. I don't believe in the Trinity. So now your, your, whole, your whole thing that you've come with is flawed. Everything that you begin to do is flawed. And you're like, what are you talking about? I, don't, I, I agree with you in that. And then you're stuck with, okay, now you're going to have to revert back to any way to this principle. It's trying to find out whom it is that I'm speaking to. Understand that. Which we're going to talk about some of the principles uh, in just a moment. Of how you can go from not knowing someone at all, meeting them, and gaining enough information out of them in, in a very short amount of time in order to know how to deliver to them the correct doubt. And, and that's really... The, the sticking point of being a successful du'a, especially when it comes to doing it in the streets. We're going to talk about the particulars in a little while. Number three, wisdom and tolerance, taking center court. Now, what I mean by taking center court is that you want to be in control of the conversation and not in an overbearing manner. You don't, you don't want to seem like you're talking at someone, you know what I mean, and you're just overstepping everything with them, not letting them get a word in edgewise or anything of that nature, but you want to make sure that, that you are in control of the conversation. And we're going to talk about a principle of how to do that, which is going to also um, help you with principle number two. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a separate principle, but they are synonymous with this. The way you can do that is by making sure that you are the one that is on the offensive in sense of making them say or making them 
not say what you want them to say, but in a sense making them go in the direction you want the conversation to go in. Rather than asking them, like you get in a, a group of people and you start talking to them a lot on uh, the oneness of God and maybe they're an atheist. And you start asking them about their beliefs. Okay, what do, they, what do you believe about God? You know what I mean? Uh, give me your arguments about this. And that's how you go down this road. Then guess what? This person gets to ramble and ramble and ramble and ramble uh, on about their beliefs um, while everyone around is watching. And they're, they're doing what? They're taking in that devil. They're taking in what he's saying. And what happens if a couple of people decide to leave at the, at the midpoint of what's being said? Then all they've gotten is what he said, and they're going to walk away with that. You've really done no effectiveness towards the surrounding people that are watching, or you have done no, no, nothing so far to bring that person in. Now, some of the ways you can do this are, you know, by more or less going back to knowing who it is you're talking to. And and let me see where I'm going to skip to that one actually because I don't want to, I don't want to skip it. Let me go. Okay, I'll just put it here because apparently that slide's going somewhere. You do this by asking closed-in questions to find out whom it is you're talking to and to take center court in the conversation. What is a closed-in question? Closed-in? Closed-in question. It's a yes or no question. Yes or no. Closed-in question is a yes or no question because it's, it's direct and to the point. Like, uh, for on the flip side, what is an open-ended question? An open-ended question is a question that leaves room for uh, interpretation, interpolation, uh, interjection. It's, it's not a very defined question. For instance, a closed-in question would be to me to ask the person whom I've just met, you know, and we have broken into a conversation, however I've introduced that, uh, by maybe asking them, do they want to know the purpose of life, or, you know, do you, uh, do, you, do you know that God created you for a purpose, or whatever it is that you break in with and break the ice with, you want to start finding out who it is you're talking to and taking them to court. By asking them, for instance, do you believe in God? This is a closed-in question, yes or no? If they say yes, I already know, okay, I'm dealing with someone who believes in a higher deity. If they say no, then right away I know I'm dealing with an atheist, so I can take that direction of giving them dialogue towards atheism. If they say yes, okay, then I say, do you have a religion? Do you have a religion? That's a yes or no question. If I say, okay, yes, I have a religion. What is your religion? Christianity, that's a closed-in question. Even though it's not a yes or no, it's still closed-in because it, it, it's, it's a, a one or two or three word response. I'm a Christian. All right. Do you uh, have a denomination within Christianity? Are you a Methodist or are you a Baptist or are you a Pentecostal or whatever have you? Now that you've asked them about four or five questions, you immediately know how I need to deal with this person. If they said yes, they believe in God. They say yes, they have a religion. They're a Christian. They um, are a Baptist, so they believe in God as being three. So now I automatically know how to start using all that stuff you learned before. Or if they say, no, I'm a Unitarian, then now that you know that they are a Christian who believes in Jesus as the begotten Son of God, as begotten of God, but they do not believe that He is deified as being God Himself, that God is only one. Or if you're dealing with Jehovah's Witness, you've got to go out on that entire road, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu. Do you, you see what I'm saying? But out, out of that few moments and those few questions, I've already assess this person and know how now to give them direct dialogue. Now, on the flip side of that, if I were to ask them, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about God? That's a, that's a seriously open-ended question. This person could go on for hours if they wanted to, and you have invited it. You invited for them to tell you that God lives in the trees, all the land, in the sky, and you know what I mean? That you, you've given that open invitation to hear stuff that you already have no shadow of a doubt about is ignorance. You understand what I'm saying, right? So you're not really overbearing them in, in, in controlling the conversation in an arrogant way, but you know, you're kind of picking and choosing how you want to go down this road. Um, and, and if you ever watch any good Mormons who give doubt, I'm not talking about you know, first two week uh, rookies, I'm talking about some veteran Mormon um, du'at, they are du'at for the Christian faith, or any good Jehovah's Witnesses, you will see them use these tips and tricks on you, because these are not something that is um, only known amongst Islamic da'wah. This is generality coming from the Islamic principles as well as psychology that Allah understands very well, so that's why these principles you find them in Islam. But they've also been used by many other religions. And, and they take them, the only difference with a lot of these uh, missionaries and Mormons, and especially when it comes to missionaries, like if you talk about uh, evangelical missionaries and things of that nature, you will see them go to the extremes in some of this. 
uh, which we will deal with at a later time, how to, how to deal with it and counter that. But you want to make sure that you are in control of this conversation. And you need to have wisdom, which is and, and is the first thing that Allah says, hikmah, that you call to the way of the Lord, your Lord with wisdom, with hikmah. Now, when it comes to this wisdom, uh, is wisdom, is hikmah, something that can be obtained through one's own merit, or is it granted? What do you, what do you think? In the Islamic scheme of things, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with wisdom and how he's spoken about wisdom. Do you think it's something that you obtain through your own merit alone? Like you can study enough books and send in enough scholars that all of a sudden you become a wise man now? Or is it something that is granted to you? Both. Um, something is granted to both. It, it is granted. It is both, but, but not to the extent that I said that it's all of your own merit. That you just study enough books and all of a sudden you're wise. It, it is granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and a, According to most of the ulama, that, that wisdom generally comes when one has gained knowledge and they apply that knowledge. They apply that which they know. This is what is in term being granted wisdom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He is the one who bestowed wisdom on, on, on Luqman, or He gave wisdom, He grants wisdom to whom He wishes. So it is Allah that gives us the wisdom, which is a, in, 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 Reality, a meaning to understand the knowledge that we have so that we practice it. This is a big difference in Islam. Uh, and, and this is what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in every single raqa of salah. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-mustaqeem, which according to a lot of the mufassirs, uh, some of the great mufassirin of the Quran say that this sirat al-mustaqeem is, is the path of, of those whom Allah has granted wisdom and our knowledge and they act upon it. This is the straight path. To be granted knowledge and wisdom and to act upon that path. Sirat uh, al not upon those whom you have had anger on, who are Bani Israel. And why was the reason Allah cursed them and punished them so much? Because they were granted so much wisdom and knowledge from Allah, but they did not act upon it. This was what brought Allah's anger and Allah's wrath. So you have people who have knowledge and they act upon it with wisdom or on the straight path. Allah says, Those who are angry with have that knowledge. But they don't act upon it. Therefore, it has become a curse on them and Allah is angry with them. And then you have what? Well, People who have action without the knowledge. They act upon that which they have no knowledge of, which is what the argument Allah puts forward in the Quran to the Christians. Why do you say that about Allah, which of you have no knowledge of? So these are the three categories. Those who have knowledge and wisdom and they act upon it. Those who have knowledge, but they do not act upon it. We're not asking Allah, don't make us a Jew. Are you asking that in the, in, in, in the, in the Fatiha? Are you saying, Ya Allah, uh, guide me on the straight path and don't make me a Jew? No, but don't put me on the path of those whom you've earned your anger upon, meaning that we show their attributes by having knowledge which we don't act upon. We're not asking Allah, don't make me a Christian. No, we're saying, well, and don't allow me to act upon that which I have no knowledge of. So we're asking Allah to grant us that knowledge and the wisdom and the, and the fortitude to act upon it. As the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever Allah wishes to grant good, he grants him faqihu fi deen, understanding of the deen. This is the wisdom. Is that faqihu fi deen is the wisdom that Allah gives to understand his deen. This is the type of wisdom that I'm speaking about uh, when it comes to da'wah. Wisdom and being a wise da'i will not come by just sitting and learning da'wah. It will not happen like this. And it will not happen by you just deciding to get out and go and do da'wah without knowledge. The wisdom of, of da'wah is going to come when you gain the knowledge of how to do da'wah properly and then you go act upon that and do it. This is where you see the success of, of, of this call coming, when you have both of these together. And unfortunately, we have two separated groups of, as of now. We have people who know about da'wah, they just don't do it as well. And then we have people who are doing the da'wah a lot, but they don't have the knowledge to do da'wah. This is why we're not seeing it as great as of a success as we should see with the numbers that we have and the, and the amount of people involved in that. So wisdom and tolerance. Tolerance means that you might have to deal, you might have to deal with some roughness every once in a while. You might have to deal with some harshness. You might have someone approach you and put you in a doubt situation. And the way they might approach you might be very rough. They might come and be very aggressive towards you. And, and, and we're seeing that side of people really, really taking a broader face, especially here in America right now. We're seeing kind of 
the people losing their fear, as when they're trying to say all over the world, this coin term, losing their fear. We see people here in America losing their fear of saying really stupid things about Islam. We're seeing that as well. So it's, it's happening on all fronts. So you might be dealt with in some aggressive or hostile manner. So you must be able to have tolerance. If someone comes and starts screaming in your face, why do you stupid, bleeping, terrorists, don't go back home where you came from, and this and that and the other, how are you going to deal with that? And turn that into an opportunity for doubt. If you punch them in the face, I can guarantee you that the, the opportunity for da'wah has passed. You missed that opportunity. Um, if you scream and yell back and start cursing, which I have seen people do, then you've, you've lost the point. Uh, you may feel good about yourself for a few moments and you're going to feel really stupid later on. Um, now, how is a way that you think you can deal with this? Someone comes to you aggressively. I mean, almost in a, in a, in a, in a vulgar language. What, what do you think you should do? How do you think you should deal with that? How do you think we should deal with it? Do you think we should hit them? Show them who's boss? Do you think you should show them that I'm no punk? I'm a grown man? I don't have to be talked to like that? I mean, do you think we're really in a situation to do that? What is the wisdom behind that? You know what the wisdom behind that is? is you're going to jail. What's the wisdom behind that? You're going to jail. And if you hit the wrong person, you may be going to jail for a very, 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 very long time. So there's not much hikmah behind that. Um, one way that I have seen it dealt with uh, by a good friend of mine, you guys all know Yusuf Estes, I'm sure. Um, we were sitting somewhere, I forget where it was at, and some guy was just came up and he just started railing on us. It was three or four of us. You stupid bleeping, I mean, I can't even repeat the words he said. And you know what Sheikh Yusuf was doing the whole time? He had that big silly grin on his face. You know, that big silly smile he has, and he's just nodding his head like, he's just nodding and nodding and nodding and nodding, and the guy is just losing it. And then when he finishes, he's like, are you done? Are you sure? Do you got any more to get out? He said, okay, first of all, let me say thank you for asking me about my religion. <laughs> and the guy was like, what? I didn't ask you anything about your religion. I cussed you out. But he's like, thank you for asking about my religion. Do you feel better now? And the guy really honestly, that, that, that little smile and that little you know, joke at him really made him calm down. He really, after that he ended up, he listened to Sheikh Yusuf for about 45 minutes. He took a Quran, he took some DVDs, and uh, he, he apologized sincerely for how he had treated us. And he left with a completely different image of Islam than he had when, when, when he approached uh, all of us. Uh, we were talking about having tolerance and having wisdom and da'wah. And I'm going to read just a couple of things so it's not directly from my mouth. From, from the book that I have recommended for everyone who wants to be seriously involved in da'wah to get this book. Does anybody have this book? It's called uh, the Islamic Awakening by Sheikh Uthaymin. This is a book you should all really simply seek into getting. The Islamic Awakening by Sheikh Uthaymin. It's called, uh, you can write it down, you can go on Amazon, you can find it, go on the internet and find it, but uh, this is one of the greatest uh, concise in the English language books for da'wah that I have gotten my hands on. Uh, it was written by Sheikh Uthaymin Rahim al when speaking about wisdom and tolerance and having forbearance when giving da'wah, when we were talking about being dealt with harshly or whatnot, he said, The da'i should believe that through his da'wah to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tawheed in him, he becomes an inheritor of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This sentiment should have the effect of encouraging them to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their da'wah and encouraging them to be patient desiring their reward from Allah, and they should also be steadfast and firm in calling into the way of Allah when dealing with hardship. Hardship should not steer them away from their mission, and hopelessness should not overcome them. The true da'i is confident about the path they are treading, and they are always hoping for positive results. They are confident regarding two matters and hopeful for a third. They are, com com they are confident, number one, they are conveying the truth, and number two, that they will be rewarded in the hereafter as long as their intention for good deeds, and they are hopeful that they will people will be guided through their da'wah, whether this occurs at the near or distant future. 
They should also be patient, steadfast, and the caller must patiently endure any harm that is inflicted upon them by people. For whenever one assumes the role of the da'i, harm will necessarily come to them, the source of which are those that are opposed to the truth. The harm they inflict can be verbal in nature, but can be physical as well. The caller does not, or the caller does well to remember that such harm was inflicted on the Prophet وسلم, and all the noble, noble messengers before them, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily many messengers were denied before you, but with patience they bore their denial until they were harmed, and our help did reach them, and none can alter their decree of Allah. So patient is a lofty level that is achieved only through the bearing of much hardship. Again, I truly strongly suggest everyone to get their hands on this book. So, having this tolerance and wisdom, are there any questions about that? Like, to what extent do we go? How bad can it get? What should I do in this situation? Any questions so far? When it comes to wisdom and tolerance and taking center court? Any questions so far? The, yes, brother. The question is, uh, if they go uh, all the way, if they are really aggressive to the point to insult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, how I can just uh, react accordingly? <sighs> And now that's where it gets to the extreme. If they go to the point of insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you not having, you know, done anything to uh, aggravate that situation or insulting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we should still have wisdom and tolerance. But this goes to a point now to we directly need to be ready to defend the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to be able to defend the honor of Allah azza wa jal in clear and plain language. Uh, because this person is coming from an area where they really are not doing it in an ignorant fashion. If they are doing it in an ignorant fashion, we let them know of their ignorance. If they're doing it in a, in a um, deceitful manner, then we let them know the, that what happens to this type of deceitfulness and this type of aggression towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger. This is something we are to be clear about. You know, if somebody comes and starts abusing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, I now have the opportunity to defend myself. to Not defend myself, but defend the honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say, hold on a second. You must truly be ignorant about the Prophet ﷺ for you to be able to say these things. You know, start letting them know about the characters of this beautiful man and how contrary to the art to any of the misgivings that people may have about him. Uh, so this is, is, is something that I believe we should do, is defend the honor of the character of the Prophet ﷺ and the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at the end of that, you still want to be able to come to a point where you can ask them, look, do you really want to know about Islam? Do you really want to know about Muhammad ﷺ? I can tell you. You know, but I wouldn't say go that route before you, you make it known the clarity of the condition of the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and let them know the, the true fallacy of what they're talking about and, and the harm that is going to come to them, not from me, but from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, from your Creator. He is going to deal with you on this uh, because that is a very serious crime in Islam to maim the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not a crime that is just within Islam, if a Muslim doesn't know, if a non-Muslim does it, it is considered a crime in Islamic law. Uh, so it is something that we should, uh, you know, address and deal with, uh, with wisdom and tolerance at the same time. You know, you don't say that, you, I wouldn't suggest someone just to call, that someone calls the Prophet a bad name and you punch them in the face. Because all you really do is cement that ideology that they have, you know, that, that the Prophet taught anger and hatred and violence and so on and so forth. Uh, it needs to be dealt with, with with wisdom and tolerance, and everything needs to be put in its proper place, inshallah. Any other questions? Uh, I just want to add to it, you know, if, if the situation is going that extreme that they're attacking Prophet Muhammad or Allah Ta'ala, it's better to withdraw from the situation. Yeah, I mean, if someone is um, aggressive to the point that they won't, don't want to give up this argument, uh, you know, they don't want to give up, just, just continue to abuse, you just walk away. You know, that is one thing we have the right as a human being is I don't have to be, you know, dealt with, uh, you know, in, the, in this type of manner. I have enough dignity to walk away. If you want to act like an idiot, then, you know, I'll, live, I'll leave you being an idiot by yourself. You know, it's not like you can, you can cure everyone. You know, some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not desire to guide them. What are you going to do? You know, so there's a time you can ask to walk away, uh, you know, because some people do go to extremes. I mean, there have been plenty of lectures where I've had to have, actually have people, you know, removed from the room. It's happened on a number of occasions where I've tried to be as tolerable as I can and as, and as, uh, you know, as uh, humble and, and as polite as I can. There's a point where you got to be like, okay, this guy is here for trouble, so we need to you know, ask him to, to leave. That's it, get out. 
I mean, there comes a point where it's enough of enough. Yeah, for sure. Even in Quran, the Prophet Muhammad has been told by God, you are just a born or you, you, you can't convince me. No, you can't convince them. That God gives that. For sure. Any more questions considering this topic at all? Okay. Next, be presentable. This part of the Minhaj of Da'wah, look like a Muslim. Now, this is going to take some explaining. The first one shouldn't take a lot of explaining. Be presentable. That means you look decent. Uh, you're going to go, uh, you know, and, and Muslims are, are um, exhorted in the Sunnah of the Prophet to look decent at all times anyway. You will never find for me a, an attribute of the Prophet uh, where he's known to be dirty, or where he's known to be, you know, um, uh, have his hair misshapen or his beard all crooked and out of place and he didn't smell good. We, you know, you don't see any of this in the Prophet. We see exactly the act, actually the exact opposite. You know, even if the Prophet ﷺ only owned one garment, that garment was always known to be clean. That garment was almost always known to be white, you know, and, 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 and that's a formidable thing to say in that day and era, to always be seen with a clean garment on. And this was the way of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They were clean and presentable. The Prophet ﷺ always smelled good. He was known to be someone who smelled very good. He used the siwak on a, on a regular, regular basis and exhorted that if it was not a compulsory, if it was not going to be a burden, I would have made it mandatory for you to use siwak every time before you pray. So, it, you know, the cleanliness of a Muslim is, is, um, should be unquestionable. But you want to look presentable. You know, you have on some decent clothes, that you, you, you know, you look right, you look decent. Uh, and also, what I mean by look like a Muslim, um, what would you, if I told you look like a Muslim, what is the automatic thing that you, what, what is the front of the first things you think about? Look like a Muslim. Shape. What is it? First thing you seem to like shape, the shape outside. Yeah, yes. The outside. Anything else? Like particularly, what do you think I mean by it? Look like a Muslim. Humble. 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 This is all part of looking like a Muslim. What about exterior? Do I mean you need to put on a thaw? No. It's not, it's not obligatory to wear a dress. <laughs> it's not obligatory to wear a thaw. I, I wear it because it's honestly very comfortable. And I love wearing a thaw, but I, I, you know, I don't wear it all the time. And it's a walking billboard for Islam. But keeping our appearance within Islamic guidelines. This is what I mean. Within the Islamic guidelines and principles. Uh, as far as for the men, we have a dress code exactly like the, exactly like the women, but with a variance of the amount. Uh, that, that is, that is, that is uh, to be dealt with. For instance, a woman, her appearance should always be, she should always be wearing and dressed properly when she leaves her home with something that is not tight, with something that is not see-through, so that it can, you can see through to the skin, you can see the color of the skin. She should not be wearing something so tight that you can see the shape of her body. Uh, she's supposed to cover all of her arwa, uh, which is, uh, you know, covering from head to toe, with the exception on some difference of opinion of the face and the hands. There's of course, a difference of opinion between niqab and non-niqab, so on and so forth. But she has these guidelines. The men have the same thing. We're supposed to, almost exactly the same rules apply. We're supposed to go out presenting ourselves with something that is not so tight that it reveals the shape of our body. Realistically, this is part of a man's uh, uh, dress code. He covers his aura, which, which a man's aura is what? And I know we're getting into a small subject here, but I'm just trying to give you an ideology. A man's aura is what? What is the impermissible points of his body that cannot be seen? Except but by his wife or someone that he can be married to. From the navel, From the to, navel the to the knee. From the navel to the knee. So the navel to the knee of a male should always be covered with something that is not tight enough to see the shape of your body. You know, like if you come to the masjid and you see some, you see it happen, brothers come to the masjid wearing some you know, some, some tight running uh, wind pants, you know, or very, very tight jeans, and you can almost count the change in the back of their pockets, you know what I mean? Then they go and they pray in front of me, you know, and then you bend over and you make your ruku and sajood, and, you know, and stuff for the love, but everything is there, you know what I mean? Everything is presented for me, right in my face, you know, this is not proper. A man should wear something, it doesn't have to be so baggy, you know what I mean? But it, it needs to be loose enough to where it doesn't show the shape of his body. It cannot be see-through, you know, it, it just can't be see-through. And he should cover that at all times and in all places. Uh, unless he's in front of his wife or something like that. So what I mean is staying within those guidelines, you know, and having the Islamic correct presentation about you. 
and, and this was something that was known to be part of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This was not culture or tradition, such as uh, the lihya, which we, is a whole other ball of wax that we not want to get into today. But you know, having the presentable characteristics of a Muslim is important uh, because the Prophet ﷺ defined for us an identity. When we look at the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and how he commanded us to be and act and, and so on and so forth. He, he, he gave the Muslim, through the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an identity that is unique, uh, that is unique from anyone else. And, and the Prophet sallallahu was very keen on Muslims having this identity. And there are a number of hadiths where he stated uh, you know, about how a Muslim should appear and so on and so forth. And then he would make the statement on a couple of occasions that, that go to the root of this identity when he would say, Khali from Mushrikeen. Differentiate yourself from those who associate a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, when speaking of the Jews, he would say that they always pray how? When talking about shoes, they would always pray barefoot. Or I think it was, they, they would always pray barefoot. So you sometimes pray barefoot and sometimes pray in your shoes. Be different from them. They grow their beard or their mustaches and they trim their beards. Khalifa al be different from them. You trim the mustache and let the beard grow. So he was, you know, formulating not just to be opposite, but to have our own unique identity. So that, that gives us a strength, a, a source of is and, and, and honor within ourselves. Uh, and this is a very, very important subject that Muslims have really fallen away from, which it comes to the identity of a Muslim. But that's a whole other subject that I'm attempting to write a paper on, inshallah. But presenting yourself like a Muslim. Also presenting yourself like a Muslim in, in your dealings with people. Like if I'm a male and I'm going and, and I just so happen to be in a situation where a woman asks me about Islam. Should I go beyond the means just to give her da'wah? Should I stick out my hand, shake her hand, give her a big hug, you know, this, that, the other, invite her, you know, uh, to go out and have a you know, nice dinner with me sitting down. Is this the extent that we should go to? No, we stay within our guidelines. We keep our own demeanor. We keep our own identity. We keep our own dignity. You know, if I'm dealing with a Muslim, with a woman, I have no problem and with with you know when she extends her hand, letting her know, look, this is you know part of my religious uh, belief is that I don't uh, put my hands on any woman that is not my wife or my mother or someone I can't be married to. It's just to respect you, you know, and and. When you tell them that in a very short and beautiful and sincere manner, they, they're very, I've found very few people that are scoffed at that. You know what I mean? If so, they already have some level of ignorance that's just beyond me. Uh, so I keep that, that, that type of adab or that type of focus. And, you know, and if, if it's a situation to where I know I'm going to have to go and be alone with this woman and talk to her in order to give her down, then I go and I send a sister to do it. You know, and we just keep those guidelines. The same with women dealing with men. Uh, we just kind of keep that guideline because of the fact that we want the sincerity to remain uh, and the intention to be correct in our da'wah. Our intention is, is, is not to guide them. Our intention is to invite. And to invite in order to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot do something that is pleasing to Allah by displeasing Him. You cannot do something to please Allah by displeasing Him. Uh, it's just an oxymoron. You can't say, okay, I'm trying to be pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I'm doing things that I know he does not like. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. So we have to keep the Islamic guidelines at all times when, when, when giving down, inshallah. Any questions about that? Uh, what is the uh, simplest way to invite? You know, what is the easiest way to tell in, well, you know, in, in this society we are living in? Well, realistically, there is no easy answer because it's situational. Is dealing with the, the uh, setting that you find yourself in. You might be talking, you know, the, the approach might be different with, with many different people, with many different groups, you know, but the underlying principle is that we should, you know, be trying to advise them of the purpose of their existence on this earth, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Him as one, and to do those things which please Him and to avoid those things which displease Him. So any way that you can go about provoking this thought process in them, is, is beneficial. Any way that you go about it, you know, as long as you don't do something impermissible in and of itself. Uh, but anything that you do, there's not going to be any magic pill. You know, it's just realistically yes. learning how to deal and approach people. And there's no magic pill for talking to people either. You know, uh, you just have to do it. You have to break that barrier and learn how to deal with people and how to interact with people. Because when anyone that does any type of um, marketing, which is 
the idea we're talking about is marketing Islam, not as a product, but uh, as the only right way of life. When it comes to marketing, the hardest, the hardest marketing is is what's called um, uh, is is I'm trying to remember the exact term, but it's person to person, one on one, you know, VIP type of marketing. When you're one person talking to one person, that's the hardest sell of all. So dealing with that, you can talk to a group of people, you know, and you, you can talk to them a little bit more easier than you can talk to one person. Uh, not all people are like that, but most people. So anything, you know, that is going to bring them to that thought process is, is workable. Is but there are a lot of different ways. Is it not the best thing that you uh, just give them a Quran in the English language? I wouldn't say it's the best. It is a formidable, it is a, um, a beneficial way, yes, give them the Quran, for sure. That's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is by inviting them to an open house of the masjid. You can have a da'wah table where you're inviting them and you're asking them questions like, you know, getting people to the table and ask them, do you want to know what your purpose of life is? So on and so forth. So, 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 there's a plethora of ways. Uh, that's why I say that the, the best way to get experience in this field is by getting out there and, and doing it. Learning it and then get out there doing it. That's, that's the only way that I've really had any success in doing this is when I really got out there and started doing it, just being forced uh, into the into the forefront to actually have to call people to Islam, you learn that way, uh, inshallah, with the right foundation. Yes, brother. Uh, Sheikh, if you are, just in case if you find yourself in that situation about what happened in, uh, in Florida, about that priest who decided to judge the Quran mm -hmm. and then after eight minutes, he decided the Quran is guilty and he will burn it. Mm. Uh, if you are in that situation, what are you supposed to do? Well, I mean, you deal with those things as well with wisdom. When it came to this guy in Florida, which I was living in Florida when this all happened. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Yeah, I was living about 40 minutes from there. Terry yes. Jones. Yeah, when it all happened. Yes. And, and there was a lot of people that were acting crazy and getting angry and we were going, oh. You know, after thinking about it for a moment, we, we, we sat down and actually had the opportunity to speak to this guy in New York. We went to New York when he went to New York, you know, uh, for the for the anniversary of 9-11 last, last uh, September. And we had a chance to speak to him, as well as Keith Ellison and a couple other people were speaking to him. And what, what we said to him and to the Muslims around him were getting very angry. They were getting very aggressive with this guy. We were like, look, hold on a second. What he is doing, and I told him in front of him, I said, what you are doing is not new. If you want to be the first, if you want to think that you're going to be the first person to pile up a bunch of Qurans and burn them, you, you're, you're about 1,300 years too late. And number two, what he is doing is not impermissible in Islam. It's not impermissible in Islam. Uh, and and when, I, when we went down this road, you started to see all the Muslims' light bulbs started to go off. And you started to see the, the rage come on his face because he realized how fallible of arguments said. Like I said, because in Islam, the two, there are two permissible ways to get rid of a Muslim. Like these on the wall. Well, how do you get rid of them? Two ways. You bury them or you burn them. And the more preferable way is to burn it. The more preferable way is to burn it. So I said, what he's doing is not impermissible in Islam. Uh, I said, if he wants, you know, we can call all the masajid, you know, thousands of the United States. We can ask them for all of the old copies of the Quran that they keep in, you know, in, in the storage rooms and stuff like that that have fallen apart and that are no longer usable. We can ship them to you. You give us an address, we'll ship them to you. And you can do us a favor so that the, you know, the, the, uh, the environmentalists won't have a harassment about us, you know, burning a bunch of Qurans. So, so you can deal with them. And I said, and, and you will not be setting a precedence because there is a man thir over 1,300, maybe over 1,400 actually years ago who set the precedence of burning the Qur'an. And who was that? Who was the one who authorized a collection that we now see right here on the wall today? And then took the rest of the Qur'ans, had them gathered together, and he burned them. Yes. He authorized a, a copy, said these are the authorized kirat, and so on and so forth. And he burned the rest. Yeah. The rest that was, that was different from this, he had them compiled and burned. So I said, he already set that precedence there 1,400 years ago, so you're not really doing anything new. You know, so what you're trying to accomplish really is, 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 is really not going to do you any benefit. So you see the wisdom behind that, that we took that situation and turned it into a complete almost joke. You know what I mean? Even though it wasn't a joke, but his intention, if he, if, if he dies like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold some wrath on him. 
but we turned it into a joke, like, you know, I have the saying go, uh, um, uh, when you have yolk in your face, you know what I mean, when you try to throw an egg at someone and you actually ended up getting yolk all over yourself, that's what, he, that's what he ended up looking like. So we have to stop for a moment when we see these things happening and to sit back and think about it for a second. Muslims are too quick to be reactive without thought, with just a pure emotion. We just react, we get angry. You know, I mean, it's just the way it is. If, and, and, and I've seen that all over the Muslim world that I've traveled, honestly. And, and this is not a poke at any country, but it's just like that. Like some Muslims may not even know what's going on, but if they see a riot happening in the street, people may, uh, fighting and chaos going on, they just go get involved and pick a side just because something to be angry about. I'm angry, everybody's angry about something. Let's go take it out on whatever it is. So it, we just have that problem within us. We need to do things that we do with, with um, pure thought and with pure intention. And that's fine. There's no problem with being angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we do with that anger is a whole other story. What we do with it is a whole other story. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, the only anger we ever really see out of him is the anger for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But anything that we see him do is with careful forethought and with wisdom and with, with, with a, um, a pure objective in mind. He didn't just do things randomly, get angry and say, let's go do this. So, does that make, make more sense? We deal with things with wisdom. Uh, we sit back and think about them and we ask the people of knowledge. Any other questions when it comes to this whole present presentability? On BBC, uh, he was giving an interview to Terry Jones. He was asked, did you read Quran? He said no. <laughs> Why well, I mean, the, the, the realistically, the more he opened his mouth, yeah. the, the more damage he did to his argument. Yeah, because everyone realized he was a complete idiot. You know, I mean, he really was not educated whatsoever. So he really, he really stuck his foot in his own mouth many occasions, and and it's just, it's just unfortunate. We see that type of ignorance happening. I don't know if any of you saw the CNN special Sunday night, you know, unwelcome about the, the masjid in Tennessee yeah. and Murfreesboro. And I know the imam very well. No, and I know the imam very well. And if you see the people, <laughs> it's almost a comedy show, you know, realistically. <laughs> The attorney, the guy, the guy that was, you know, taking the Muslims to court, he actually tried to take Islam to court, you know what I mean, and put Islam on the trial. The city council to the court. Yeah, the city council, you know, and, and the lady who was financing all the lawsuits, I mean, if you listen to their arguments, and I'm glad they showed it because any educated American who watched that is going to think, these are complete idiots. They had no, I mean, even if you have a, a problem, okay, deal with it in a, in a, in a you know, educated and, 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 um, uh, you know, a wise manner, the way they did it was very ridiculous. I mean, it, it went beyond, beyond belief. So we, sometimes we just need to sit back and, 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 and let things, uh, see how things are going to play out. You know, it's a stuff for a lot. I don't want to, you know, assimilate it to a card game, you know, and gambling and stuff like that. But it's always, my, you know, my grandfather liked to play cards. He used to always tell me, you know, that the, the, the key to playing a good game of cards is know what cards to play next. You know what I mean? You know, holding your cards and knowing when to play them in a wise time. And, and we do this in Islam. We hold, you know, and withhold reactions sometimes in order to play the wisest move. And we see this through the life of the Prophet Sallallahu And we see this through the military commanders uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even when going to war and things of that nature, like Khalid ibn Ali, Ali ibn Talib, they, they even when these things were such as, uh, you know, going to battle and stuff like that, they, they did these things with wisdom. And, and with playing the cards right or playing their moves right. They never did things just haphazardly. And we see this with the Prophet ﷺ in his da'wah and how he dealt with people. He never did things haphazardly. He always did it with wisdom and forethought. Any other question concerning this issue? It's a good question to me, Anything else? Because realistically, you know, we're doing this job, and I do this job, not, not so that everyone can come to Islam, because I know that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? Uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if He wanted everyone to believe, then he, they would believe. Um, you know, He already has made it known that there are going to be Muslims in the world, they are going to be disbelievers and mushrikeen. And so that's just the way it is. But I do this job not so that those people who do want guidance can receive that guidance and can have the, the understanding of how to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I also want to do this so that I can stand in front of Allah blameless on the day of judgment for having done my job and as a secondary point to make no excuse for anyone. 
on the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I get out there doing that job as a warner so that there is no excuse. This is why the Prophet sallallahu was sent, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, he sent him as a nadira, he sent him as a warner, a giver of glad tidings. But he sent them so what? So that there would be no excuse. I sent you so that humanity would have no excuse before me on the day of judgment. So, so realistically, I, 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 that we can do that as well. We're trying to more or less sift the sand. You know, who wants to be where they fall, that's fine, but we're going to do our job, inshallah. Number five, you must have honorable sources of income. An honorable, honorable source of income. And this should be a no-brainer, but this is very, very important. If you want to be calling to the Lord of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one of the attributes of the da'i was that you must be yourself doing those things which you're calling other people to do. So goodness of your character is already, should already be in there. But when it comes to da'wah specifically, anything that you put towards da'wah effort should be made sure to be from honorable sources of income. You should make sure where the money is coming from and what the money is being put to. Uh, and, and this is very, very important when giving da'wah. It should be from honorable sources. You can't ha win a lottery and, you know, and build a master. You can't you know, have someone who, who you know, deals in, in, in riba and interest and so on and so forth and you know this without clear without a doubt you know come and offer you ten thousand dollars say okay I'm gonna use it you know if these are not honorable sources of income then it's something that we should stay away from as Muslims uh, because it, it's just going to bring no benefit whatsoever uh, because it is not money that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with or has blessed in any way if it is from haram uh, sustenance and when it comes to money that you do take in for da'wah, if you get involved in a da'wah organization or da'wah projects, you need to make sure that you deal with the Muslim's money very wisely. And this, is, this should be said for anyone who deals in any type of non-profit for you know, an Islamic entity, that you need to make sure that you deal with the Muslim's money very wisely. And this was told to me by one of my dearest, dearest teachers in, in, in this work, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he used to always tell me that, he was very particular on what he did with every single penny that he received in order to give da'wah. He said, because if you play with the Muslims' money, which they have given sincerely to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to put forth this effort of da'wah, and you, you play with that, then you're going to have some serious, serious problems that you would never even have imagined. And it is absolutely 100% true. So you need to make sure that all the sources of income for everything that you do in da'wah is uh, halal sustenance. Any questions on that whatsoever? Is that pretty clear? It should be from halal sources. And this is also one of the attributes of, of a good Muslim. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ uh, were, were known to be, and this is stated by some of the ulama, they have made the statement that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were very keen, one of their attributes was they were very keen on everything that they took in. Everything that they have gained was from halal sustenance. Everything they put in their mouth must be from halal means. And they did not really play games from that. That was kind of, and some of the ulama say that this is kind of like a, uh, a litmus test for your taqwa, your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you question everything that comes to you, whether it is from halal sources or not? You question everything. The, the companions used to question everything. If someone brought them a bowl of food, they would ask, from what does this come from? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did this as well. When someone would present them a gift, what would he do? He would ask, where is this from? Is this from the zakah, which I, you know, or the sadaqah, which he could not take? You know, what is this from? So on and so forth. He would question, where did you get this from? So this is one thing we need to make sure we know where all of this is coming from. Number six, and this is a big one. Be willing to help others and ask for help. Ta'wan wa tawassul. Ta'wan means you are willing to do what? To help people. You are willing to put your help in when help is needed. You're willing to help when help is needed. Are you willing to volunteer? Are you willing to get involved? Are you willing to, to you know, join this effort, whatever it may be? Uh, but when brothers and sisters ask for help, you are ready to give that help. And the even more important one than that, which is something that Muslims tend to have a problem with, especially male Muslims and men in general, is to wasu, asking for help. You need to know when to ask for help. A Muslim should have enough knowledge to know when they need help and be ready to ask for it. Um, first and foremost, we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then we seek the means to that help through His creation. We seek the means to that help through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He's created. You cannot say, okay, 
Ya Allah, I want you to make sure you are razif, so I expect that my, you know, my check is going to come in the mail for my rent and my power bill, and I'm just going to sit at home and read Quran and, you know, and, and memorize a hadith. It, it just doesn't work like that. You can say, yes, I've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you haven't made any effort within His creation you know, to, to, to facilitate for Allah to answer your dua. Uh, so you, you got to put some work behind it. So you need to ask help. If you know you're overwhelmed and this project is going on, this Dao project or whatever have you, be willing to ask for help. Say, look, I need to know. I can't get this done in my home. Um, and then there should, on the flip side, always be this revolving door of people who are willing to help and people who are willing to ask for that help. Because some of us will be, you know, I got it. No, I got it. You know you, know you don't have it. You know you don't have it. And you know that if you, even if you do get it done, that it's going to not really be as good as you would like it to be. Ask for help. Ask for somebody say, look, I need some help with this. Can you, can you handle these few emails or you can't handle calling this and arranging that or whatever have you? Be willing to ask for that help. Now, this is when the Midhaj of Da'a, we're talking about now the prospect or the, um, the mud'i, the one who is called. The one who is called. We're dealing now with some of the Midhaj dealing directly with people and how you should be able to deal with people. And these, again, are just some basic principles. These are not in any way um, comprehensive. They are very concise. First and foremost, you should have strong arguments for Tawheed. Because we're calling people to have Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one of the attributes or, or yeah, one of the attributes of the Da'i was having uh, knowledge, having ilm, and having Marifatul uh, Islam bi adilati wal hujjah Having knowledge of Islam with evidence and proof. So if you're trying to invite people to Tawheed, then you need to have some strong arguments for that. You need to have some strong arguments for Tawheed. You can't tell me I want you to believe in the oneness of Allah. They say, okay, tell me about the oneness of Allah. And you just say, oh, well, Allah is one. Qul <laughs> Allah that's, that's just not going to hit home with a lot of people. You need to have arguments for that. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us arguments for Tawheed in His book? Does He? Yes. For sure. This is the majority of the Qur'an. The, 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 great, the greatest portion of the Qur'an is speaking about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and arguments for this Tawheed. There is a very beautiful book um, that is written, that, that is published in the English language which is going on my website as an appendium for books on da'wah, which I'm almost done compiling, which is called Beneficial Speech in Establishing the Evidences of Tawheed. Beneficial Speech in Establishing the Evidences of Tawheed. And it was compiled, compiled by Sheikh Mokhbid, Sheikh Mokhbid from Yemen. Uh, and, and this is a beautiful, beautiful book. And it is about this big, maybe 150 to 200 pages. But it's called a strong, or called a uh, beneficial speech in establishing the evidences of Tawheed. And it goes from the Quran, it goes from the Sunnah, it goes from logic, it goes from science, and all of these matters. Because you need to have this evidence of telling people about, about, about Tawheed. Uh, and why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one? Why is, it why, why is it necessary that Allah be one? Because there are arguments for that as well, why the, it is necessary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be one alone. There are arguments for this, and Allah puts this forward, why He has to be one. And one of the arguments is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, had there been a God other than I, a creator of the universe other than Him, of the heavens and the earth, He said both of them would have been destroyed. Both the heavens and the earth have been destroyed, had there been any God other than me. So Allah is putting forward the argument that it is necessary that I be one alone in order for the a creation to continue to exist. Just for the creation to continue to exist, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be one. And it has to be tawheed in the world. I mean that without it, everything comes to a complete cease. SubhanAllah, it's a very strong argument. But unless you understand how to relay that argument to people, it is going to do you no good. So I would suggest this book, um, The Beneficial Speech in Establishing the Evidences of Tawheed, by Shaykh Muqbil ibn al-Hadi al-Badi, rahimahullah. Any, any questions about that? Establishing strong arguments for Tawheed. Anything? They always, when we talk to not a Christian in general, they, they said the all one, hmm. the divine. <laughs> so the all one. So God is one for them, but it's divine ones. How will we respond to this? Well, I tell them the first problem you have is in the very statement that you make. 
Um, either, either you don't understand English very well, or you don't understand the concept of one. Because to say they are all one, I mean, that <laughs> they are all one. There's, there's a problem in the English language. For me to say, okay, I got a, I got a, I got a paper cup here, I got a, uh, glasses here, and, and a book here, and they're all one. I've made grammatical mistakes in the English language already, you know? Grammatical mistakes in the English language already. Not only have I logically and, and rationally made a, a very bad mistake by saying all three of these things are one. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. Um, and, and, and that's the very silly argument that's even put forward in the Bible. It says these three are one. It's just very silly because when you look at the attributes of Jesus Christ, and he had attributes about him. He was a human being. He ate, he slept, he drank, and uh, you know, he needed to sleep, he needed to... Uh, all of these, he needed air, he needed water, so on and so forth. Um, he, he remembered things at times, he didn't know things, so on and so forth. All these different things. And we look at the attributes of the Creator. What are the attributes of the Creator? Ask them, He's omnipotent, He's eternal, He is all knowing, He is all seeing, He's all hearing, He's you know, all present. And, you know, and then what are the attributes of the Holy Spirit? They have no idea. <laughs> attributes of the Holy Spirit, uh, they'll tell you all kinds of weird things that makes you speak in tongues, you know, it gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit, it makes you feel this and that. Well, you just described to me three completely different things. So to say all three of these things are one is very silly. So God needed to eat and sleep and drink and the, yes, okay, well, you just said he did not need these things. So you see, this argument kind of leads its unfortunately, this, this Trinity argument is kind of like a never-ending spiral. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's a point where you have to step off. Either they're going to come to what you have to say and agree with it, or you're going to eventually have to get off this ride. You understand? Because it's a never-ending ride. <laughs> it's a roller coaster that just doesn't stop. Eventually you're going to say, okay, hold on a second, let me off. You just keep going, you know what I mean? So it comes to that point. Either they're going to agree and get off with you, or you're going to have to get off yourself and just let them keep going. Uh, but you need to have that strong argument to understand what is God's nature, what is Jesus' nature. There are very unique arguments uh, going towards Trinitarian Christianity and, and Buddhism, Hinduism, and all of these things. Any other questions? Yes, brother. Uh, so according to number one here, so the Muslim, if he doesn't have enough information about Islam and about Tawheed, mm -hmm. uh, which is he doesn't have enough tools to help him. Mm -hmm. So supposedly it's better if he just keep quiet, not to get involved in Yes and no. Um, no, he should not talk about that which he does not know of. The Muslim should never do that. He should never talk without knowledge. Uh, but it does not excuse them from the, uh, from the obligation of doubt because they still have enough information. Every Muslim should have enough information to at least initiate the conversation. If not, then there's some serious problems going on. Um, and, but if they do not have, an, like for instance, if someone comes and talks about uh, there's this new religion, I cannot remember at all, but, uh, it, it's becoming popular in the UK. It's got the weirdest name about gods from outer space. It's not a new concept, but it's a new religion that's been formed. If someone came to me and told me that this and they want to debate with me, I really don't have any, you know what I mean? I don't know. So I would want to kind of, you know, direct them towards somewhere or someone that can, you know, directly, you know, deal with that. Uh, so you see what I'm saying? I have not freed myself from saying, okay, I don't know anything, so I'm going to let this guy go in his ignorance. No, 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 at least, you know, here, here's some information, go to this website, or talk to this person, or give me your, you know, contact information, let's meet again another day if you want, and I'll bring somebody with me who can answer these questions, you know, so at least I initiate the conversation and leave the door open for them to gain more information. I don't close the door, you know, in their face. I can point them in a the direction at least. I mean, it was a drug dealer who led me to Islam. Muslim was sold drugs, and he didn't tell me a single thing about Islam except to go to the masjid, uh, but he's the reason why... You know, I'm here today about the political of Muslim power. So, you know, we can do something. At least something. Any other questions? We're going to stop in 10 minutes, inshallah. Ten minutes. Number two, they should be aware of major religions, concepts, and isms. They should be aware of major religions, concepts, and isms. Now, the key word here is aware. They should be aware. I did not say you should become a uh, specialist in every major world religion, ism, and, 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 and concept because you'd be fooling yourself. Uh, you could spend much more beneficial time learning about Islam. Uh, but you should be aware of the major world concept, religion, and isms. 
and, and, and the awareness that I think that personally I think we should have is the awareness to know enough about the religion to know the fallacy behind it and how to counteract that with Tawheed. You understand what I'm saying? Knowing enough to know, understand why they're astray and to how I can take them from where they are to Tawheed. Like if I'm talking about Buddhism, I don't want to go become, you know, and, and know about every single order of, within Buddhism and every single sect. And I don't need that. I need to know what their basic belief principles are and, and how that is contrary to the belief in Tawheed and how to bridge that gap between where they are and where I want them to be. That's it. That's all I need to know. I don't need to become a specialist in the field. The only reason I deal so deeply with Christianity is because that's just how I was raised. It's almost a second nature for me to go down that, to be able to think like that and go down that road. Uh, I wouldn't want to say that I can do that with every religion. To do that with Buddhism and Hinduism and atheism and Confucianism. I mean, I know enough about their beliefs to, to show them their fallacy, but if they want to get into some deep, deep details, uh, it's beyond me. I will be out of, out of my uh, league and look forward them to someone else. Any questions about that? And that can be pretty easily achieved. You know, when going and getting a book on major world religions, there are some good ones out there that tell you the basic, without getting too deep into the basic concepts and beliefs of major world religions and things of that nature. You can go grab one of those books, you know, a few hundred pages you've gone through, a majority of the people you're going to run into what they believe, you know, what are their fundamental principles and belief, and so on and so forth. Or if you want to be more thorough, then you could look for that from maybe some of their sources, rather than getting a, a second-hand source. You can go and look at these major religions and, and see what is their beliefs, and so on and so forth. Uh, How would you deal with like, some of the New Age stuff? With the New Age? Well, then, because that stuff changes really, and it's it's really when it comes to New Age belief and, and, and deism, uh, someone who is a deist, really the book is so open that you really kind of have to find out what they believe. You know what I mean? You kind of need to go a little bit deeper into finding out what do they particularly believe. Uh, when it comes to this whole spirituality type of deal, you, you need to go to that. You know, but when dealing with someone who is a deist, or dealing with someone who is a New Age spiritualist and so on and so forth, or religion, or even a Baha'i, uh, which is a former religion, but they have those same principal beliefs. You know, when I had, I had a, ended up getting into not a debate, but a dialogue with a Baha'i in the UK, uh, which any of you know what Baha'i is. They, they believe in the, the goodness of all religions, the validity of all religions, as long as that religion, you know, leads to, you know, you uh, being pleased in the God and an afterlife and so on and so forth. But they believe in like, um, any, any of the way you get to God is okay, as long as you get there. You can be any religion to be behind. You can go follow anything. My question was that, you know, would God in his wisdom and justice create human beings, place them on earth, you know, and, and then tell them, then tell them you can take any role that you want to as long as you get to me in the end. I mean, does this sound like a... Uh, you know, an all-knowing, and all-wise, and all-just God to just say, just go, as long as you get to me, don't worry about how you get there. Because then that leaves room for the argument of the human being on the Day of Judgment. Look, you did not give me a defined road. If I got lost, don't blame me. You know what I mean? If you didn't tell me which way to go and I got lost, then realistically, that's not my fault. You know, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and God leaves no room for the human being to make that argument. He, he created them, defined their purpose, gave them prophets and messengers and books and guidance and defined method that this is the way to get to me. This is the only way and every other way. Then this is wrong and it will not lead to me. This is more logical. I mean, imagine if you got into a car and turned on your GPS and put an address and it said, pick a road. Just go. Turn. When you get to the corner, it says, turn any way you want. You be like, wait a minute, I'm never going to get there. No, you might eventually get to where you're going after a few hours. If you're just trying to go two miles, it might take you two years. But, you know, GPS is telling you, just go whichever way you go is okay. No, you want to know how to get there. And this is how the human beings are. We, we know where we're at, and if you know where you want to be, then you're also going to know how to get there. And God has solved that with sending his prophets and messengers and books and guidance and religion to your hand. So, you know, in, in that sense, there has to be a defined way. You know, this whole to do what you feel, that's realistically the fall, flaw of human beings. To just do what I feel because that type of new age spirituality, Baha'ism and all this is really just 
a religion that, that feeds the wants and desires of the soul. I'm going to do whatever pleases them to me. If this is easier for me, I'm going to do that. If that's easier for me to do that. And, and that's really the, the human being's biggest downfall, is trying to just make this happy. When we know the Prophet wasallam said that the appetite for the, of the human being to, to make their, their, their soul happy, that appetite will only be filled by one thing. And what is that? Sin. The dust of the grave. It's the only thing that will make this satisfied with anything in this life is the dust of the grave. Nothing else is going to fill it except that. The Baha'i, don't they also claim that they're Muslims? Yeah, they do claim they're Muslims. Actually, Baha'ism broke off from Islam a, a while back from someone who actually claimed, first and foremost, the, the founder of Baha'ism. This is, we're not going to go too deep in this, but the founder of Baha'ism was a Muslim who followed a, you know, a, a, a kind of an out, out there sect uh, of Shiism. Uh, I think it was from the Zaydi or something like that. And he claimed to be the Mahdi. First he said he was the Mahdi. And then he said he was a prophet. And then he said he was God. And that's why they call him, uh, the, 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 they call the prophet the, the Bab, the gate. The gate, uh, the, the gate to, to, and they call it Baha'u'llah. That's what he initially called himself. That's what he named himself, Baha'u'llah. Uh, the, the way to God or whatsoever. So it, it actually broke off this uh, But that's a whole other ball of wax from somebody who claimed to be the Mahdi. Anyone who claims to be the Mahdi uh, without the proper evidences that we all know from the Hadith of the Prophet you can already tell that this person is probably out of their mind. Because there's a lot of people who claim to be Mahdi over the years and they've always ended up coming up with some crazy religion all of their own, unfortunately. Any other questions? And I heard that they said that the Mahdi has been found in Tunisia now. So I'll video about that. Some TV station. Oh, we didn't get so we the three. Oh, get the three? Oh, okay. I almost went too far. Number three. This will be the last one. Don't underestimate or overestimate to whom you're calling. Don't underestimate them and don't overestimate, and overestimate them. What I mean by don't underestimate them is, is don't ever underestimate who you're talking to in terms of what they may know about Islam and what they may know about their pertinent religion or in anything. Um, you can be very fool. I remember that there was a guy in Texas who came up to me. He was where he, he was real Texan. You know, the tight Wrangler and jeans and big, big huge belt buckle like this big and 10 gallon hat and you know, the tassel and everything. He came to me, he was like, are you one of them Muslims? Just like that, redneck accent. I said, yes. <laughs> I thought he was going to ask me some ignorant questions. Well, I should, why don't y'all go back home with this and that and the other? No. He started asking me about the authenticity of, 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 of hadith that, that were found in some of the collections of, of the, 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 the six authentic books and chains of narrators and the authenticity of these statements and that statements. I mean, he really got into some, and, and this was maybe five, six years ago when I didn't have that much of an knowledge of that field. He really was beyond me. Uh, and he was just asking about you know, how is it that these Muslims can, can take some of these hadith as, as part of our religion when we don't really know the validity of Islam and so on and so forth. You know, so don't ever underestimate anybody. People may know more about Islam than you think. Um, and people may be asking you questions you never know when someone asks you a question that they already know the answer to. There's another thing we're going to talk about at the very end. Uh, but don't overestimate them either. What I mean by don't overestimate them is don't make in an attempt to an attempt to make someone uh, uh, cordial towards you and to establish a rapport with them, don't make them feel too good about their disbelief. Don't make them feel too good about their disbelief. You know, don't, don't tell them, you know, that all, oh, like we see, unfortunately, happen a lot of times, where we overpraise a group of people and, and in reality make them feel very good about their disbelief. Like we talk about the Christians, you hear some people, oh, we're the same, we believe in the same God, and we follow, you know, the same prophets and so on. I, I know you've heard this, you know, that Christians, we're very, we're, you know, we're, we're like one and the same. You just, you start to see this, <laughs> unfortunately, play out in, the, in Egypt a few weeks ago. The Muslims and Christians are hand by hand, one and the same. I said it the day it happened, that as soon as they get what they want, they're going to be killing each other. I said it. <laughs> and what happened there? As soon as they got what they wanted, they started killing each other. But anyway. Um, but making them feel good about that. Oh, we believe in the same God. Oh, you're a Christian, we believe in the same God. Hold on, what is it? We do? Realistically? 
your, your God hangs on a cross? Astaghfirullah. Your God came on this earth and lived and ate and breathed? No, my Allah doesn't. My Allah and your God are completely different. This is why I'm calling you to come over here. So I don't want to make them feel too good about their doubt. Uh, there's, there's a methodology that I like to use, which I've used this in the martial arts business for so long, and it's something that I learned as a teaching technique. It's called PCP. PCP meaning praise, correct, praise. Have any of you ever heard of this? If, you, if any of you have been in the education field, you've probably heard this before. PCP, praise, correct, praise. For instance, if I have a student who is doing a certain move, and, 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 and I'm telling them to do a, you know, a, a inner forearm block or whatever, a middle stance or a front stance, and let's say they're doing it all wrong. I'm not going to run them and be like, oh, you're horrible. Look at that. It's terrible. Look at your stance. It's so weak. I could break you in half and stand like that. You know what I mean? Because realistically, I'm not going to go teach them anything after that. Uh, I've really lost all rapport with that person and teaching them anything is going to be very difficult after that point. And they're going to probably not do anything right again for a while. More or less, I would go to them and if I see, okay, they have their, their, their arm bent wrong and there's not bent or whatever, I'll go to them and say, look, you know, that stance you have is good. I like that stance. You know, all I need you to do is you just bend your knee a little bit more, you turn your foot in, take that forearm and bend it out at a 45 degree angle, just like that. That's exactly how I want you to do it from now on. Do you see the whole different scenario that I praise something that they were doing right? So get a little rapport with them and then tell them what they can fix and then praise them for fixing it and correcting the mistake. So, so dealing with people like this, you know I mean, that, that okay, we do give credit where credit is due. There is some goodness in Christianity, as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there are some people within them that are inherently good, and when the truth is presented to them, they will accept it. They will accept it. But then Allah says most of them are defiantly rebellious. But we give that credit where credit is due, that there are some things within Christianity, yes, that we do know was probably given by Isa alayhi salam. You know, some of the parts of the Bible may have truly been written by some of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or been revealed by Allah. There is that remnant there. But you give them the problem. You give them the situation. And, and, and then if they come to the understanding, then you congratulate from that. If not, if they continue on the absence, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you go from the phase of, of, of uh, you know, admonishment to warning. If they continue upon that, then you warn them. That the warning that following this path is going to lead you to destruction in this life and will lead you to hellfire in the next life. This is, this is the doubt of sin. This is just how it goes forward. You've done your job. Any other questions? Any questions about this point? Um, I'm just asking, you, you said between the Christian and the Muslim, you can't say we got the same God. You can't tell them we believe in the same God. I, 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 would not, I would not suggest to do so because you don't know what their belief in God is. If they're a Christian, you never know. They could be someone who believes that Jesus is God. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying the, the fact they're saying we believe in the same God, they say we believe in the same God, but Jesus is the Son of God. Yes. So we call him the Son of Mother. Yeah, but they think that's their God. They think that is God. That's, that's the only problem I'm saying, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls to them in the Quran, He says, let us come to the same agreement. Let us come to the same understanding that we believe in one God. He did not say, Allah did not say that we have the same belief in one God. No, Allah said, let us come to that same belief. You see, this is a problem that, that many people misconstrue through interpretation and through translations in the Quran, that this is a calling to say that Christians and the Muslims have the same God. No, Allah says, let us come to one word. So it's going to be, it's going to be haram to say that. I wouldn't, I, don't, I can't make any haram or halal statements, but I, 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 I would say it's something that I do not believe, believe that we should be doing. Because we don't know what they believe and you don't know what you're saying about your belief by agreeing to their belief. Sorry, you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. We believe what is right. If you come to this belief, you'll be right too. That's true. And this is the is of Islam and this is one thing that will be presented to you is, you know, why are Muslims so arrogant, you know, that you think that your way is the only right way and who gives you the right to do it? God gave us that right too. I mean, this is not telling you my way is the right way. No, my way is not the right way. The way designed by the creator of all that exists is the right way. And for him to say it's the right way, he has the right to do so. That's true. He is Allah. For him to say, this is my straight path, follow it, and do not follow other paths, for they will not lead you to the right place. That God has that right. I'm only reconveying that message. So there's no evidence on my behalf. I'm, I'm telling you that, and I can't, if I'm on that road, then I'm on the right path. And if you come on with me on the right path, we'll both be on the right path together. I'm not telling you to follow me. I'm telling you to get in, get in the right path. To follow you know, the truth. Yeah. To follow the truth, not to follow me. Exactly. Nobody should follow 
one individual in that sense. Even, even Abu Bakr عنه, gave that admonition very clearly when he accepted the Khilafah. He said, look, you know, the only infallibility around us was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So after him, if I do good, follow me. If I'm doing right and telling you to do right, then follow me. Your, your, your obedience to me becomes obligatory. If I am in error, then your obedience to me is not obligatory and you should correct me. Put me back in the right spot. So that's, that's, that's what we need to be, to have that dignity and honor. That God designed Islam. He designed the creation. He has the right to tell you that if you do this, you'll be right. If you don't, you're going to go to hell. That's not coming from me. That's coming from God, the creator of all that exists. I'm only conveying the message. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Any Sorry, other questions? Uh, over all that, <coughs> when we get to the point of argument or the point of da'wah or the mm -hmm. point of, you can say, 